Okay, so welcome to uh, this next video uh, on the store operated calcium entry. Now, um, if you hear bangs in the background, do not be alarmed. It is bonfire night and there are fireworks going off outside, so um, I'm not being shot or anything. So, um, store operated calcium entry then. So, um, I now want to uh, discuss some experiments that you can do associated with store-operated calcium entry. And now that we've discussed the entire pathway, we should be able to predict the outcome, basically, um, uh, of doing these experiments. So, let me just um, summarize store-operated calcium entry, and then we'll go over a few experiments. So, um, we stimulated uh, this H1 receptor with histamine, and that led to the production of IP3 here, inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Turning over the page, IP3 then uh, causes the release of intracellular calcium stores from the endoplasmic reticulum and causes a calcium puff. Now, um, when that calcium goes from the ER into the cytoplasm, something needs to then remove it from the cytoplasm. One mechanism, the main mechanism, is that it will be returned into the ER by the sarco endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, the circa for short. Another option is that it can be extruded from the cell membrane via the plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase. So it can be thrown out of the cell uh, and into the extracellular fluid. This raises a problem because after everything's over, and we've returned the calcium in the cytoplasm back to normal, the calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum must have gone down because of the calcium we released from the endoplasmic reticulum, only some of it was returned to the ER. Some of it also went out of the cell. So that means that the amount left in here must be lower than the amount we originally had. So, we can't continue just doing this because otherwise we're gradually depleting our ER calcium store and then we won't be able to, cal we won't be able to conduct calcium signals um, uh, if we continue doing this because eventually this ER store will be empty so we won't be able to do anything. Okay, so calcium signaling would come to a total halt if it were not for a mechanism for refilling the uh, ER and that's uh, store operated calcium entry. So, uh, when uh, calcium goes down in the ER, it uh, means that the EF hand domain of the STIM1 protein, which stands for stromal interaction molecule 1, uh, loses the calcium that was bound to it. That causes a change in conformation of the stromal interaction molecule 1, and uh, that change in conformation is a change to a more linear structure like so. Okay. And uh, when, uh, when STIM1, this stromal interaction molecule 1, takes on this conformation, it aggregates into these STIM1 aggregates. And then what happens is that the uh, CAD portion of STIM1, which stands for channel activation domain, interacts with uh, the aura I protein, uh, which makes up the aura I channel, also called the store operated channel, or the calcium release activated calcium channel, which is in the plasma membrane of the cells. So, STIM1 overall causes uh, this aura I channel to open and allows calcium to move from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm, and then that calcium is moved by the circa pump back into the endoplasmic reticulum, and this is a way of rejuvenating our calcium stores. Okay, so the first experiment I want to describe to you then is what if we do this histamine stimulation of the cell in the presence of something known as gadolinium? Okay, so I need to discuss with you what gadolinium is. Gadolinium is an element. Now, it's what is known, it is what is known as a uh, rare earth metal, basically. So, um, if I just draw a picture on this piece of paper here. If I draw a picture of the periodic table, then over here you have groups one and two, the alkali metals and the earth alkali metals. Then in the middle you have the transition metals here, and then you have groups three through seven here, like so, okay? And then you have the noble gases right on the end. 
Now, there is also another portion of the periodic table, and it's one of these portions that you only ever look up in GCSE physics class to look up where the uranium is, basically, or americium-241 is the other one I can remember looking up. It's these two lines right at the bottom. Now, these are what are known as um, the um, rare earth metals, basically. So these are rare earth metals. Now, gadolinium is an element that you can find in this portion of the periodic table, rare earth metals. It has the symbol GD, so if you want to find it on your periodic table, GD is what you're looking for. And its atomic number, which means the number of protons that it has in its nucleus, and therefore also the number of electrons that the neutral element has, uh, oh dear, atomic nucleus, atomic number, um, is 64. Okay, so that introduces gadolinium, and it's somewhere around there. Uh, I don't know actually how many elements it's in, but it's somewhere around there you'll find gadolinium. Okay, right. So gadolinium basically likes to exist in, a, in an ion state rather than uh, as a, a neutral element. It likes to lose two electrons. So it likes to become a uh, divalent cation, basically. Now, for our purposes, that's all we need to know about gadolinium, uh, except one last fact, the most important fact of it all, in fact, that gadolinium blocks this plasma membrane-associated calcium ATPase. It blocks this pump, which is actively transporting calcium out of the cytoplasm. Now, if you remember, this pump is the main problem. This is the pump that causes the entire problem. This is what causes the need for calcium, for store-operated calcium entry. Because when we release calcium from the intracellular stores, some of it is re-uptaken re, uh, into the ER by the circa pump, but then some is chucked out by this plasma membrane calcium ATPase. And you remember me telling you that the sodium calcium exchanger is also a a pump that can uh, move calcium out of the cell, uh, but its physiological role is at toxic calcium levels. It doesn't really, it's not really going to react basically to just a calcium puff. Instead, the plasma membrane calcium ATPase is our main enemy in all of this. So, if we block the plasma membrane calcium ATPase with gadolinium, then that's not going to function anymore. So all the calcium is going to end up being moved gradually by the circa back into the endoplasmic reticulum. So we shouldn't end up with a need for store-operated calcium entry. So if you do this experiment of blocking um, the plasma membrane calcium ATPase with this uh, ion gadolinium 2+, what, what would you expect to see if we now stimulate the cell with calcium? So if we do this graph again where we're looking at calcium concentration versus time, well, what we will see is our initial um, rise in calcium as the intracellular stores are released by histamine stimulation, and then we won't see the store-operated calcium entry. So usually what we'd have is a tail that looks like this which is the store-operated calcium entry coming into action uh, because the calcium in the ER has gone down, basically. So this is what you'd see without gadolinium. But with gadolinium, you see a result that looks more like this, which is basically just the result that you get from just releasing the intracellular stores. Uh, that's the spike in the calcium concentration that you get from releasing the intracellular stores, i.e. the calcium puff, and then you don't get the store-operated calcium entry. So that's a nice little experiment. So this is with gadolinium. Okay, so that's the first experiment I want to describe to you. Uh, now what we will do is we'll discuss what, you, what happens if you remove um, all extracellular calcium, basically. So, uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the cell with histamine, but this time we're going to have completely removed all the extracellular calcium. So we've put our cell in a Petri dish, and we can control the extracellular medium, so we've removed all the calcium from that extracellular medium. Now, what's going to happen if this cell tries to turn on Capaci uh, capacitive calcium entry or store operated calcium entry. Well, there's absolutely no calcium in the extracellular fluid. So it can try as hard as it wants, basically, to bring in calcium. It can open up 
the um, store operated calcium channel or the aura eye channel but there's no calcium out here so you're not going to get the movement of calcium in okay so if you do this same experiment where you stimulate the cell with uh, histamine but with no extracellular calcium again what you see is just the calcium spike but as you release the intracellular stores uh, which is triggered obviously by the rise in IP3 due to the activation of the histamine 1 receptor okay but you don't see uh, the, um, the store operated calcium entry tail basically of this graph that you would see usually if you just did this um, experiment physiologically okay now what's also interesting is to now later on add the calcium back in so you leave this cell for a while uh, and now what's happened is that the cell has extruded some of the calcium when it did this calcium spike when it undertook this calcium puff it extruded some of the calcium now you might say but surely that means that there's now calcium in the extracellular fluid I have put this cell in a petri dish basically let me just describe to you what I've done I've taken this one cell and I've stuck it in a petri dish basically that dot that I put there is meant to represent my cell in this petri dish it is tiny if it extrudes a few I don't know, 1,000 calcium ions, more than that it will be. But if it extrudes some calcium ions, those calcium ions are going to go off into the abyss, basically. They're going to get completely lost in this massive volume of extracellular fluid that I've put here. So there is not a chance in whatever that this cell is going to see that calcium again. So as far as it's, I, I'm concerned, the fact that the cell has released some calcium into the extracellular fluid has not changed the extracellular fluid calcium concentration. It's still zilch. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is add some more calcium back into this fluid. So I'm going to return the calcium into the extracellular fluid at the normal level. Now, ever since I stimulated the cell, the ER calcium has been too low. That will mean that you have STIM1 aggregates in your ER membrane which are activating the aura eye channels. So the aura eye channels are open and waiting for calcium to uh, come in through them basically. So as soon as I uh, put calcium in the extracellular medium, the calcium is going to go through those or excuse me, through those aura eye what aura eye channels and um, you're going to see a rise in interest under the calcium and indeed that is what you see so when you return the calcium in you'll get a rise that looks maybe like that and that is the store operated calcium entry so store operated calcium entry okay so this is where we returned the calcium into the medium okay so there's another interesting experiment that you can do returned calcium into medium okay uh, now we'll talk about two ways in which you can induce store-operated calcium entry. Okay, so one of the ways you can induce store-operated calcium entry, uh, um, well, experimentally, is you can block the circa pump. So there is a pharmacological agent which can be used to block the circa pump. Okay, so let's say this is our ER here, which has this uh, high level of calcium sequestered in it so this is calcium rich okay and here is the circa pump here standing for the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium atpase now this pump works continuously basically it moves two calciums in in exchange for three protons out and when doing that it needs to hydrolyze atp now the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum is not completely tight some calcium is always going to leak basically back out of the endoplasmic reticulum so there's a constant leak of calcium out of the endoplasmic reticulum so the circa is continuously having to account for this leak and has to continuously return the calcium that's leaking out back into the ER basically okay so if you were to block the circa and there is a drug which blocks circa known as Fapsi Gargan which is a fantastic name 
Fapsi Gargan. It's not used clinically for anything, but it is a very powerful experimental drug. Fapsi Gargan blocks the circa, the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, and therefore stops you returning the calcium that is leaked out of the ER back into the ER. So what's going to gradually happen is you're going to deplete the calcium in the ER as it just gradually leaks out, basically. Okay, now if uh, the calcium level in the ER goes down, that's going to change the conformation of STIM1. STIM1 is going to aggregate, it's going to activate the store-operated calcium entry. So what you'd expect to happen is store-operated calcium entry to be activated, and indeed it is. So that's an experimental way of activating store-operated calcium entry if you want to do some experiments on it, basically. And there's a lot of reasons that you might want to do experiments on it, because there is evidence that certain enzymes can only be activated by calcium, which is entering the cell through store-operated calcium entry. There are certain adenylyl cyclases uh, such that they are positioned in a compartment such that they can only be activated by store-operated calcium entry. Um, and there are other targets which seem to only... Um, be activated by calcium if that calcium is coming into the cell through store-operated calcium entry. And you might ask, well, how on earth do they know whether the calcium is coming in through store-operated calcium entry? And basically, the reason is that um, these um, you don't just have these this store-operated calcium entry happening through the normal cytoplasm of the cell. Instead, what happens is if I draw a picture of the uh, whole cell here, so if this is the cell, then this is the ER. What instead you will have is you'll have this store-operated channel like this, and maybe the STIM1 aggregates here, and you will have them in a little micro-domain. So you will wall this little compartment off, basically. So let me draw um, some... Um, let me colour this in. So we're going to use the actin cytoskeleton to produce us a great wall around this compartment so you can't compartmentalise it away from the rest of the cytoplasm so that calcium coming through this pathway just goes through this little compartment. So the way in which you can have enzymes which are only activated by calcium coming in through this mechanism is to have enzymes sitting in this compartment basically and there are indeed adenylyl cycles cyclase enzymes in there, specifically adenylyl cyclase 8, and there's other enzymes which, again, can only be activated by this mechanism. And it's an area of current research, basically. Uh, but this sort of concept of having a little compartment within the cell, which is compartmentalized off from the rest of the cytoplasm, is what is known as a micro-domain within uh, a cell. And if you want to learn more about it, I talk about them at length in my cyclic AMP signaling playlist. Okay, right, uh, so uh, what next? Oh, another way in which you can trigger um, store-operated calcium entry is to use calcium buffers. So basically you can put in molecules known as calcium buffers into the ER lumen. And these calcium buffers will basically bind to all the calcium. So let's say this is a calcium buffer it will bind the calcium ions so that the free calcium level in the ER goes down hugely. Now, if the free calcium level goes down hugely in the ER, then uh, calcium will basically dissociate from this EF hand domain of the STIM1 protein, and then that will change conformation, aggregate, and activate store-operated calcium entry. So there is a final way to activate store-operated calcium entry.